From all the newly acquired aerodromes in North Africa, every available Allied bomber takes to the skies. Their mission, Pantelleria. For one month, this island was subjected to terrific bombardment. But on June the 11th, the signal for surrender was observed, and the first soil of Italy collapsed before the victorious Allies in a spirit of unconditional surrender. The result can be said to be a major victory for the RAF. At the moment, however, before experts have examined the technical problems involved in scientific air bombing of ground batteries, it is probably unwise to assume that the reduction of strongly defended enemy coast by air and sea action is a comparatively easy matter. The speedy surrender of the island suggests the poor quality of the Italian troops left there, together with a water situation which was steadily worsening. It may well be that Pantelleria would have been a very much tougher proposition under German defence. However, be that as it may, the island is in our hands and its importance to us as a key point for future operations in the Mediterranean cannot be overemphasized. The question whether air bombardment alone can compel surrender remains to be seen. A top-hatted man in tailcoat and all accessories appeared one day in the middle of the desert during the final operations. Men of the fighting forces who had forgotten that such things existed rubbed their eyes and wondered if the wine could have gotten to the water. But it was no apparition they were seeing. It was, in fact, the British minister to Tehran on a tour of inspection. Curiously enough, the effect was a stimulant to all and added a touch that was both strange and welcome. General Montgomery was standing before the Marath Line, that formidable strong point directly in the way of the entrance to Tunisia. At the time, there was no doubt that the strategy for the assault had already been formed in his mind. General Eisenhower came to visit the 8th Army and suggested to Montgomery that he would not be in Sfax on the Tunisian coast before a certain date. Montgomery took the bet, the stake for which was a flying fortress complete with crew. Here is the fortress being handed over, since Fax was taken and occupied with 24 hours to spare from the allotted time. General Montgomery, obviously pleased, inspects the all-American crew and looks over the controls. General Alexander and Air Marshal Cunningham lived side by side in this caravan during the operations in North Africa. The close cooperation between these two men, Army and Air Force, was a striking example to the personnel of both services and undoubtedly speeded up the end of the Axis forces in North Africa. Air Marshal Cunningham explains his strategy according to the wants of General Alexander. Having decided on the next move, they go off in complete agreement to start the great machine that put the end to Mussolini's empire. The King and Queen are welcomed by Wing Commander Gibson while visiting the Dam Busters. His Majesty congratulates Australian Flight Lieutenant Martin, who won the DSO. The Queen has a word with an American serving with the Canadian Air Force, Flight Lieutenant McCarthy, another DSO winner. While Gibson's own Lancaster stands majestically in the background, the King meets members of the crews of the Special Task Force involved in the breaching of the Moan and Eder dams. These men, hand-picked, were withdrawn from Bomber Command to train in secret for this attack which had been long in prospect. Wing Commander Gibson received the VC for his gallantry to add to his four other decorations. General Giro, deep in thought, awaits the arrival of General de Gaulle. An agreement has at last been reached between the two leaders of France, whereby each holds the rank of Commander-in-Chief and each will continue to command his respective army. Generals de Gaulle and Giro, if real and complete unity exists between them, have the power that is France firmly in their grasp. Contained in that power is the will and faith of millions of enslaved Frenchmen, their hopes, their thoughts, their all. Sergeant Cohen and his henchmen walk up to be congratulated by their AOC, Sir Arthur Cunningham, at his villa in Hammermay. Who, these three men, crew of a swordfish belonging to the Air Sea Rescue Service, were on a routine mission seeking two missing pilots. Due to a fault in their compass and lack of petrol, they landed on an island, which they realized could not be Malta. Not long afterwards, to their astonishment, 
of a medalled Italian came up and asked them if they'd be kind enough to accept the surrender of himself, his island, and all under his command. They accepted. The Italian was the military commander of the island, and the island was Lampedusa. Many times during the war, tribute has been paid by neutral observers to the accuracy of British bombs. Here in Tunis, which had been visited so many times, the truth of those statements became visible to the eye. As we fly over the main aerodrome, the bomb damage is clearly visible amongst wrecked enemy aircraft. Nearby, however, houses are intact. Row after row of buildings stand untouched in the town. Then we come to the docks. Here, nothing but devastation remains. To the bomber boys out there, we are indeed grateful. For not only have they contributed much to the winning of the Battle of Tunis, but they have also confirmed the fairness of our way of life. Let us take a peep inside Europe today. Near Berlin, a film is being made based on the life of Kruger and the Boer War. Emil Jennings, who plays the part of Kruger, is seen being made up for the camera. Goebbels, using his old tricks again, is anxious to disrupt relations between South Africa and ourselves, and the film has been made to coincide with the general election now pending in that country. South Africa has already played a more than magnificent part in this war, and Goebbels will receive his answer when General Smuts, one of the world's greatest men, is returned with the overwhelming backing of a united and resolute nation. The Führer decided to go to Spain. On the way through France, he pauses to meet the aged French Marshal Pétain and that little horror Laval, who've already sold their country and are now engaged in selling their people as slaves for German industry. But the Führer's journey does not end here, and he's soon entrained and away again. On his journey, he could be seen studying maps and engaged in deep discussion with members of his mission. Perhaps he is thinking of invading another country, or maybe he is wondering what sort of a reception he will receive at the hands of the man he is going to visit. Not long after he arrives, another train pulls in. Quick to alight is Franco of Spain. Well, he can't complain of the warmth of that handshake, but the interesting part is, he had to come to Franco, and that's news. German ME 109s fly over the Romanian oil fields of Ploeste. These pictures are shown to you exactly as they were shown to the German public. After the expulsion of the Nazis by the Russians in the Caucasus, these oil fields became vital to the German war machine. For without them, they would have to rely solely on their factories producing synthetic petrol. And those factories within range have already suffered severely at the hands of Bomber Command. The output from these Romanian refineries has been considerably increased since the German penetration into that country. But now, as the RAF slowly creeps nearer to Europe, the Luftwaffe is stretched still further to cover an area that becomes for us the target for tomorrow. It's an early morning in the western desert. Any morning, in fact, in the last months of 1942. Vic Vic squadron was a small unit in the great force which pursued Rommel across the wastes of Libya and is camped somewhere between El Alamein and Tripoli before the collapse of the Axis forces in Africa. As the blazing desert day begins, ground crews strip off the camouflage covers which hide the tank-busting hurricanes. The squadron has been moving forward for weeks now, a day or two here, and then on to a new place just like this, but nearer to Tripoli. The ground crews are always busy when the aircraft are not flying. They can only relax when the kites are away, and that can be a pretty anxious time too. This morning, as usual, there is plenty of work to do on the Hurricanes, those wonderful all-purpose machines. The Hurricanes started life as a fighter, and with the Spitfires, damaged the enemy mightily in the Battle of Britain. There are many modified fighter versions. Then came the Hurry Bombers, and now a new and formidable type, the Hurricane 2D, the Tank Buster. It is armoured with two 40mm cannons slung under the main planes. These, the largest bore weapons yet fitted on any flying aircraft, weigh only 320 pounds. 
They fire two and a half pound shells and the aircraft also carries two point three oh three machine guns, a devastating total of firepower. The Hurricane 2D is part of our answer to the German tank warfare technique and a pretty sound answer too. We've got plenty more tricks like this in store, just waiting till they're wanted. Quite a lot of any man's time in war is spent waiting, waiting until he's wanted, waiting to go into action. This very moment some tank busters are wanted in a hurry to go where the enemy has put some rear guard tanks to harass our forces. Pilots rush out to the machines. Engines burst into life. Chucks away. The can openers have a job to do, which won't wait. They taxi out. And roar across the sand into the sky. Most of the tank busters' pilots are old desert campaigners, for their aircraft were first in action in June 1942, after months of experimental work. In the first year of the Alamein offensive, they accounted for 19 enemy tanks, and during all the long triumphant pursuit, they have been doing brilliant work. Their job calls for skill and courage of a high order. Low over the desert they fly, low over the mechanized columns of our advancing army. have to climb to a great height to cross the dead ground between us and the enemy. Target below. The hurricanes peel off and swoop down to the attack. tank is blazing now, finished, knocked clean out of the wall by the tremendous power of fire from the tank buster's cannons. The job has been well done. And so the flight reforms and heads for home. For the little camp, which wherever it may be, is the centre of the squadron's life. Famous fighter pilots gave a party at Grosvenor House to celebrate the shooting down of the Thousandth Hun. More than 500 pilots and ground crews from Biggin Hill sector gave up their rations in order to provide food for the occasion. Here RAF chefs point out the result of their labours, which, believe me, left nothing to be desired. Most of these lads, chefs in Civvy Street, followed their trade into the RAF. the great hall was soon full of dancing couples. Underneath a full-scale model of a Spitfire, the bar was crammed. And it wasn't long before the reason for having the bar was justified, and the evening became a great success. After midnight, the guests were entertained by a cabaret. <laughs> Group Captain Mellon, our host, to whom the success of the party is due. 
Commodore Rennie, who shared the thousandth Hun, was there. Group Captain Edwards, VC, a bomber pilot guest. At the end of the evening came, a delegation of taxi drivers appeared. They were there, they said, to offer their services to those going home, any distance and for nothing. This merited considerable applause and provided a grand note upon which to end a highly successful evening.